I'm Helen Shent and I'm librarian and college archivist at Trinity College Dublin. And it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce our three speakers this afternoon. Um, I'll introduce them all individually um, and then they'll each speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have about five minutes for joint questions at the end. So first of all, um, I'd like to introduce to you Governor O'Riordan, who reckons that everyone in the room knows her. Um, <laughs> But for the one person who doesn't, she's a director of the Library and Information Services and librarian at the University of Limerick. And I've asked each of our speakers for one thing that you probably didn't know about them. And what you may not know about um, Godnet is that she was once National Sports Information Officer and she absolutely adored it. So Godnet is going to talk to us um, about innovation in libraries, views from the ground. Godnet. Thank you, Helen, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's really lovely to be uh, back in Galway, especially on such a nice sunny day. Um, as Helen mentioned, uh, I'm the director at the University of Limerick Library, and today I'm going to just have a kind of meander through um, spaces, innovative spaces in libraries, um, on the basis that changing spaces have demonstrated lots of other changes uh, that we're experiencing. Um, so I'm going to start uh, back at Limerick uh, with uh, this piece of sculpture which is titled Together and Apart and it was uh, the percentage art piece for the, the current library in Limerick and the, the artist really had this very strong belief in the apart bit of libraries but I think even in 1989 you know, libraries had changed a lot and they certainly have continued to change. And in a funny kind of way, the together and apart bit is more about what's happening in the libraries now rather than the library being the place apart. Um, a lot of these changes are responses to, you know, digital, social, pedagogical changes. And when we started planning for, for the new wing of the library, which is over on the left hand side of the photographs, um, we looked at different libraries uh, near and far, and I'm going to use some examples of some of those libraries to kind of kind of demonstrate the things that influenced us and, and the things that we found interesting. Uh, it isn't to say, because they are libraries afar rather than near, that there isn't really excellent and interesting innovation happening all around Ireland and, and, and nearer, uh, but I just thought it might be more interesting to see here something that is a bit away from us. Uh, so I've started with the concept of the book because, you know, even though lots of things have changed, the book is still um, a very strong brand in libraries and it's particularly strong maybe from people outside libraries and what they perceive uh, that we are. And even though this is changing a lot and it's certainly moved from books plus people to a kind of concept of, of people plus information plus technology, um, uh, books ha still have quite a strong role in our libraries. Some libraries have you know, taken the brave step and said, we're going to be bookless. But, you know, mainly they're kind of subject specialist libraries that aren't very book dependent. And they very often have another library down the road that takes care of all their books. Uh, so it's not that those subject areas don't have any books or don't need books. Um, other libraries respond by kind of building the books into the fabric of the building. And uh, there's this example here um, uh, from Cornell, and uh, you know, it's very impressive. We've seen it uh, in near at home in Birmingham and some Dutch examples. And you know, I really like this. In fact, I love it because I really like books. But unless you're starting from scratch, you know, it, it, it isn't really what most of us are doing. I think most of us are um, looking at book storage off-site, on-site, that takes some of our collections off the floor plate um, and gives us space to do other things. Um, uh, the yellow compact shelving is a photograph from Birmingham, uh, the University of Birmingham's new library, and it's got a fantastic underground cavern of books and it's so extensive, it's just enormous. And you know, you'd be afraid of getting lost in it because it, it, it's so big. Um, 
And that's kind of one approach. I think then in, in Coventry, they've kind of taken the approach of, let's put the compact shelving on the floor plate, which kind of, it introduces the whole, keeps the kind of concept of browsing, but takes up an awful lot of space. And certainly, that's the model we were looking at in Limerick for quite a while. But um, the constraints of our plan and of our space meant that really we could add six, 700 seats uh, and have all the compact shelving, but that would be it. So um, we were looking around and we were looking at what we could do. So uh, we took the kind of unusual option of going for the automated storage. Not sure it was a, a, a very wise decision. It was certainly a very um, time consuming and challenging kind of decision, but it's there now and um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, moving on with it. But um, I suppose even with all of those developments, and maybe because of all of those developments, in some of the newer libraries we've visited, um, books and collections can seem kind of invisible, but we know they're still used, and uh, we know they kind of add to the study environment. Um, and I think there's a strong case to consider how we manage the current collections, and we've had some examples of this uh, today, in um, enhancing the study space and making the collections more usable. I think in Claremont College's libraries, they have a, a new program of developing kind of active co collections, a kind of concept to make the collections more used and more usable. And certainly, uh, Joan Limpincott in a recent article has suggested that we should try to link collections, physical ones and, 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 and uh, digital ones, into our spaces uh, in a more concrete way. Um, using kind of heritage collections or curated displays or using screens to highlight portions of our collections. Um, I think we've also seen, and, and you'll be well aware of the changes in um, study space and kind of following on from uh, increase in emphasis on collection, on collaborative learning, we've got more flexible spaces and more active learning spaces. And while these are really good, I'm very conscious that um, they needn't necessarily be in the library. You know, we have ones in the libraries on the left, we have ones on the right that aren't in the libraries, and not a huge amount of difference between them. Uh, and these kind of places can be run by anybody. And I certainly came across one library that um, had um, a new building near it, had a lot of collaborative study spaces, and their business on that uh, level just went. And I'm certainly conscious that the University of Limerick is going building a nice new shiny student hub opposite the new library. So it was, certainly makes me consider about the balance between this and a kind of traditional study space, which uh, we've seen a huge demand when we, we spoke to our students. Uh, a lot of what they want is actually the traditional headstone kind of study space. So I think we, we need to consider those kind of balances very carefully and be ready to uh, adjust or adapt depending on, on the response. Um, I think service or engagement spaces are um, kind of another one that have been transformed into kind of more relaxed, welcoming, fluid, kind of informal space with inquiries, but also with other activities. I think there are just three examples I picked out from, the, from at random, really. You have the, the knowledge market, which is a kind of um, peer learning kind of service, where, almost like a triage conducted by students uh, with referrals to learning centers, people, and to library specialists. Um, the Lamb Square is, is quite a new space and it, it isn't fully finished, but again, it has that kind of um, uh, inquiry and teaching and pop-up space, uh, kind of semi-formal events, and they do have a warning saying, you might be disturbed here if you sit down to study because anything can happen. And then the ink space, which is um, more kind of traditional library focus, more kind of li librarian led, but again, quite that flexible, soft blend of kind of inquiry and instruction, uh, which is a, a, an interesting approach. And then one of the more 
recent ones is this uh, discovery bar um, at the Science Library, which is very much about making the service space very visible to the community, about uh, promoting the library and promoting the services in the library and attracting people into the space. Um, and then, of course, you know, there, as you know, there, there are lots of other spaces. Libraries have art galleries, they have meditation spaces, you know, they have spaces for your pet dogs that uh, try and calm students down or whatever. Um, I suppose uh, some of the more traditional spaces uh, in terms of archives and special collections, which um, have kind of growing importance in terms of distinguishing institutions and providing for engagement. And this is kind of played out in the spaces that we've been looking at with kind of positioning them more centrally in the library floor plate and um, adding on training spaces, project spaces. In, in Aberdeen, we had to look at a, a children's kind of engagement room. Uh, a lot of them are using kind of the digital walls to showcase uh, their uh, special collections, and then some of them would have a VIP room to attract visitors, donors, influential people. Uh, I suppose um, it's kind of technology infused spaces that are maybe more different, and they're certainly based on uh, the concept of. You know, the libraries are not just a place to access, but the libraries are a place to create as well. Uh, and also uh, zoning in on the fact that a lot of the new technologies allow different kinds of access and more in-depth access. And, and these kind of spaces certainly increase the, the, the library's offerings, uh, particularly in relation to, um, to research. And some of them kind of have been, are, are, are developed from kind of a fairly informal, small operation, leaving the space open to evolve in response to what the community reacts to it or, or how um, they take to the space. And then before it becomes a kind of very formal, structured kind of offering. Uh, this one here is, uh, it's kind of, um, its focus is on media. Uh, they want to turn ideas and um, research into multimedia projects. They offer the kind of expertise, tools, they do a lot of training and provide the space for, for this. Um, I think, you know, many of you be familiar with the Scholars Lab, which has a more digital humanities focus. And it, um, even though that has expanded a little bit now, but again, they offer that kind of range of spaces for group work, individual work, um, training spaces, consultation space, offering the expertise in uh, kind of that whole, whole uh, domain. Um, we have, moving on to another one, which was the Edge in Duke. And the kind of focus for this space is data, data and digital publishing and kind of project space. And it's, it's a kind of, you know, you go into it and it, you're kind of going, okay, yeah, th this isn't very exciting, is it? There's no big bang here, but it really is a very effective kind of space. And they have specialist labs for data and for publishing, and then general space and, and training space. And their kind of big um, selling point is the training. But interestingly enough, they kind of bring in the training from trainers from across the university. So they're almost kind of managers of the space and uh, supporters of the space and, and uh, using what's out around the university, you know, to, to open up their spaces. Um, the curve, which was kind of very much focused on visualization. And again, that was a sort of, you know, they had the idea they thought, yeah, we'll, we'll open this up, we'll try it out. There wasn't a, a huge demand for it, but very quickly it became quite a, a, a used and, and a focused space on the campus. And, um, it, it, you know, it, again, turned out extremely successful. Um, so, just kind of ramping up in terms of the technology, this Oklahoma, where they have. Um, VR workstations, and again, this is kind of interesting because they 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 um, 
they were kind of interested in just giving students an opportunity to explore virtual reality. It didn't, you know, they, were, they weren't doing a big sell or whatever, but they thought, yeah, it would be interesting for engineering students and people like that to explore this, and it would be good for faculty maybe if they were interested in having a kind of low barrier entry that they might come in and explore this and see what happened. And it really took off like wildfire. <laughs> they, they kind of have rolled these out across campus. The architecture library wanted one, the law library wanted one, which I was just amazed because I really uh, kind of um, didn't expect that, but they wanted it for reconstructing crime scenes and things, you know. So it's, um, it, it was really kind of interesting. The, their ambition was just put it out there, see what happens, give people time to explore. Uh, and it really was very um, uh, successful. And then the last one of these is um, an AI lab that hasn't opened yet, but um, the concept for this is that these people, uh, the, the kind of uh, academics had these spaces, but really wasn't getting a lot of traction because they were over in labs and kind of science buildings. And they really believed that to, to kind of get momentum around this, that they needed a shared central location and, and they decided that the, the library would be the best place for uh, this. And their aim is really, again, it's just to raise awareness, to kind of develop basic skills. They wanted to um, have uh, the university community have a much more deeper understanding of um, of AI and to have a space where they could have discussions about the ethics of this and where it was all going. Uh, and like I said, that will open up in the autumn. It'll be kind of interesting just to follow that and see what happens. Um, right. I suppose uh, my last kind of space, if you like, is this lab next. It's in Calgary. And uh, what they've done is they had a couple of different odds and bods units, you know, doing different things. And um, what they decided to do is pull them all together in a kind of marketing or design concept so that um, they're presenting all of these individual units as this uh, unified service. Um, and this kind of uh, approach has been um, taken up in uh, a, a number of other libraries, and they might have suites of studios or suites of workspaces, you know, they have different names, but, but what they're doing really is they're kind of allowing for varied development across these units. So you could have one space that's very well developed and others that's kind of new, um, but they're putting it together in a real good offering um, in terms of uh, pr providing support for the kind of evolving needs of research. And I think it really strengthens their role. Um, so that's the end of the tour. And I thought I'd just finish up by saying, you know, what, what, what did all of this tell us? And I suppose for me anyway, it was there's a lot changing and it's going to keep on changing. And it, in many respects, when you talk to people who are developing these new spaces, they're kind of designing in the dark a bit, you know? Um, they're not really sure what it's go what, what's going to happen. Um, but I suppose one of the big challenges really with the kind of change in our collections and the move to the digital is that it's kind of raising questions uh, about what is the library and it's raising those questions kind of across the university and in some ways um, it's making us more vulnerable in that um, what, people, I think university uh, administrators and managers or senior management aren't really quite sure what the library is about now and really not sure whether it's worth spending a whole heap of money on it. Um, so I think, you know, that's quite a concern and uh, I think that we really need to take a stand of aligning very closely with university goals, almost like forgetting library goals, um, taking the emphasis off some of our very internal, very process-driven activities and kind of prioritize uh, 
what the university needs and kind of really standing back and really drilling into what um, we can do on the various um, aspects of the university uh, objectives. Be prepared to let it evolve, let, let it roll out, to seriously consider kind of partnerships across the university. Obviously, it's going to be people-centered. We're not book-centered anymore. We're definitely going to have the wraparound of, of, of technology and digital, but I, I do think that that whole maintaining the link to collections and to the information we provide um, is a very important concept. So thank you very much.